There's probably no character type that's as closely tied to Star Trek as the outsider who finds a surrogate family in the rest of the cast. In the original series, this is Spock, the only Vulcan in Starfleet, a calm eye at the center of the storm of emotions that rages aboard the Starship Enterprise. Despite his differences from the rest of the crew, he comes to embody the values they represent. Every Star Trek series has a version of this character. In TNG, it's Data, though you could also make an argument for Worf. In Voyager, there are Neelix and Kess, the only natives of the Delta Quadrant to join the crew. After Kess leaves, you could also count reformed Borg Seven of Nine. In Enterprise, you've got T'Pol and also Phlox. In Discovery, Saru. And in my favorite Star Trek show, Deep Space Nine, everybody! The roster of DS9 is full of misfits and rejects, and that's by design. One of the joys of the series is watching this group of angsty castoffs form friendships with one another and gradually coalesce into a family. But even on DS9, there is one character who personifies this trekkiest of tropes more than any other, and he knows a thing or two about coalescing. Because he's... Odo. I'm talking about Odo. Unfortunately, the reason I'm talking about Odo right now is that the actor who played him for seven seasons, René Auberginois, died earlier this month at age 79. I hope you'll join me for the next few minutes as we honor René Auberginois by honoring his contribution to Star Trek, as we look at how Odo actually became Deep Space Nine's complicated conscience. It's difficult to be more of an outsider than Odo is when Deep Space Nine begins. He's been chief of security on the station for a few years when Starfleet arrives in the series' first episode. When we meet Odo, he's a member of the Bajaran Militia, which shares control of the station with Starfleet. But later on, we learned that he held the same job when the Cardassians were in charge of the station. Odo is one of the few people trusted by both the Cardassians and the Bajorans because his loyalty is only to the law and justice, and he's not a member of either species. In fact, for the first few seasons of DS9, he's not a member of any known species. Odo is a shapeshifter, a changeling, the first being of his kind ever encountered in this part of the galaxy. That alone makes him one of Star Trek's ultimate outsiders, but Odo's separation from the rest of the people living on DS9 goes a lot deeper than being the only member of his species around. As a changeling, Odo can take on the appearance of almost anything. He usually appears as a humanoid, but his natural form is a pool of gelatinous goo. This makes Odo one of the most truly alien characters any Star Trek series has ever come up with. He's unlike every other regular character on the show in a fundamental way. No one is more aware of this difference than Odo himself. When we meet him at the start of the series, Odo is an island. Though known and respected, he has no close friends. Even his trademark posture, arms crossed, shoulders square, back ramrod straight, communicates how closed off and self-contained he is. He's extremely skeptical of humanoids, dismissive of their cultures and rituals and needs for emotional and physical closeness, but he's also curious about them, a student of their habits and behaviors, observing them with a sharp eye and an unfailing memory. Both neat tricks, considering he doesn't actually have eyes or a brain. It's Odo's separation from everyone else that makes him an ideal chief of security and a great detective when there's a crime to be solved, which there often is, since DS9 is Star Trek's equivalent of a Wild West frontier town with all manner of outlaws and ne'er-do-wells passing through on a daily basis. The show's first Odo-centered episode, A Man Alone, is a murder mystery with Odo as both the investigator and the prime suspect. He's innocent, by the way. Odo would never be party to an unjustified killing. I know. I'm getting there. So, it was kind of a challenge to pick an episode to examine for this video, not just because there are a lot of good Odo episodes, but because Odo himself changes so much throughout the series, and there are so many different facets to him that we could explore. 
Even if I limit my focus just to his relationships with other characters, there's his friendship slash crush slash love affair with Kira, his relationship with his surrogate father, Dr. Mora, his love-hate dynamic with his own people, the founders, and shit, I could probably do an entire video and probably will someday on the Professor X and Magneto thing he's got going with Quark because Odo and Quark's relationship might be the most Deep Space Nine thing about Deep Space Nine. I'm not going to focus on Odo's relationships in this video, but that doesn't mean they aren't important to his character or a highlight of the show. To the contrary, Odo has one of the most poignant character arcs of anyone on Deep Space Nine. He's the loner who gradually bonds with his crewmates and then has to say goodbye in the series finale. It would be enough to make Worf cry if Klingons had tear ducts, which they don't. Right, Spock? Instead, I'm going to take a look at an episode that tells us something important about Odo himself, an episode that sheds light on one of the most confusing and troubling parts of his backstory, his time as chief of security during the Cardassian occupation. The episode is from DS9's fifth season, and it's titled Things Past. Sisko, Dax, Garrick, and Odo are in a runabout on their way back to the station after attending a conference about the Cardassian occupation of Bajor. Sounds like a fun weekend. So right away we know something horrible is about to happen. Has there ever been an episode of any Star Trek series that begins with a bunch of characters in transit aboard a support craft on their way to or back from a conference or a vacation or something where they made it back safely without incident and everything was just fine when they got there? Anyway, before the inevitable transporter malfunction or random tachyon surge or whatever the hell, the gang are having a nice chat about the conference and everyone's really laying it on thick about how great Odo is. Oh, Odo was the star of the event. Everybody loves Odo because of his devotion to upholding the rule of law above all else. That's why both Cardassians and Bajorans honor and admire him, his reputation for fairness and incorruptibility, which is totally unblemished. And Odo's sitting there like, <laughs> yeah, can we change the subject? We cut to DS9 a short time later. The runabout has arrived at the station, but Sisko, Dax, Garrick, and Odo are unconscious and can't nobody figure out why. While Dr. Bashir puzzles over this singular medical mystery, we cut to the point of view of Sisko, Dax, Garrick, and Odo, and they awaken to find themselves on Deep Space Nine, but several years in the past, during the Cardassian occupation. Also, they aren't exactly themselves. They recognize each other, but to everyone else, they appear to be Bajoran. Garrick's sticky fingers allow him to borrow a scanner from a Cardassian guard, and he uses it to figure out who they are. Sisko is a guy named Ishan Che, Garrick is Jalur Guetta, Dax isn't anybody apparently, she gets taken away to keep Gull Dukat company, and Garrick is about to tell Odo who he is when Odo says, I'm Timor Landy. And Garrick and Sisko are like, hey, good guess. Do you know anything about what's happening here? And Odo's like, no, why? No reason I should. I don't. Okay. Odo does eventually reveal that he remembers Ishan, Jalur, and Timor because they were executed for attempting to assassinate Gul Dukat, despite the fact that they were innocent. Odo, Sisko, and Garrett get picked to work for Quark for the day, and when their shift is over, they're in the Bajoran section chatting up a member of the Resistance, trying to find a way off the station so as to avoid the whole getting executed thing. They're eating soup, and Odo drops his spoon. Sisko asks if he's all right, and Odo's like, yeah, I'm fine. I definitely didn't just hallucinate having blood on my hands. And even if I did, so what? It's not as though that image symbolizes anything. What do I have to feel guilty about? Nothing. That's what. Then Gul Dukat stops by for a visit and almost gets exploded. Sisko, Garrick, and Odo are all arrested under suspicion of staging an assassination attempt. They're taken to the brig where the chief of security, Thrax, tells them that they're all totally screwed because Cardassian justice. There's something weird about Thrax, though. He was Odo's predecessor as chief of security on the station, but Garrick looked up the date, and by this time, Thrax was gone. Odo should be the chief of security at this point in history. 
There sure is something fishy going on here. Meanwhile, Dax is hanging out with Ducat in his office, watching him do his I'm sure you've heard terrible things about me, but I really just need a friend, for you see, I'm a complicated man routine, which is gross, and Dax scams him for some food and then knocks him the hell out, which is, I believe, the proper response whenever you are cornered by Gold Ducat. Worth remembering. Meanwhile, Sisko and Odo and Garrick are in the holding cell, and Sisko's like, are you sure you don't know more about this than you're letting on? Because you've been a total wreck ever since we got here, and it seems like maybe this all makes sense to you in some weird cosmic poetic justice sort of way, only you don't want to tell us because you fear what we'll think of you if we should ever learn the horrible truth of your dark hidden deeds. Am I getting hot or cold here? And Odo's like, ah. Just then, someone cuts into their holding cell from the other side of the wall, and it's Dax. And she's like, what are you standing around for? Do you not know a jailbreak when you see one? But the jailbreak is short-lived because no sooner have they made it to an airlock than they turn around and all four of them are magically back in the cell. What is this Twilight Zone shit? Thrax shows up and he's like, Odo, let's you and me talk. So they go to Thrax's office and Odo's like, hey, we're innocent. We didn't do the bombing. And here's where to look to find all the evidence you need to exonerate us and catch the real bombers. And Thrax is like, nah. And Odo's like, Okay, well, I didn't want to have to do this, but we're not who we appear to be. We're not Bajorans. We're actually a human, a Trill, a Cardassian, and a Changeling from the future. Thrax says, yeah, I know. You're busted, man. I busted you from the jump. You have been busted. Then suddenly everyone's on the upper deck of the promenade, and Sisko, Garrick, and Dax are about to be executed. So... Wait, does that mean Dax is now the guy Odo has been up to this point? And does that also mean, by extension, that Odo is Ducat's comfort woman? Because that is one slash fic I would not like to read. Please don't send me any links. I will not click on them. Odo finally lets out what he's been holding in this whole time and yells to Thrax, You can't execute these people because you're not even supposed to be here. I am. And just like that, the scene changes again. Odo and the others are themselves again, dressed in their own clothes. On the other side of the promenade, they watch as another Odo, the Odo of the past, the Odo who was really here during these events instead of Thrax, coldly presides over the executions of the three innocent Bajorans accused of attempting to kill Gul Dukat. The three innocent Bajorans, Odo and his friends, have been taking the places of up until now. Odo confesses. He was in charge of the case of Ishan, Jalur, and Timur. He was responsible for them being executed. He missed obvious clues to their innocence, which was confirmed when a similar bombing took place just a few days later. Odo explains that back then he was more interested in maintaining order than in serving justice, and because of that he allowed three people to die for a crime they didn't commit. And with his confession completed, Odo and his friends wake up in the infirmary. Later, Bashir is in Odo's office, and he's like, Okay, are you ready for this? What happened was, the plasma storm the runabout flew through activated your morphogenic whatchamacallits, which instinctively reached out, trying to link with other changelings. And since there weren't any around, they formed a telepathic link with Sisko, Dax, and Garrick. And you were all experiencing the events leading up to the execution of the innocent Bajarans because you were thinking about that right before the plasma storm hit. Isn't that neat? Kira walks in and Bashir pisses off. Kira's like, what happened to you, Odo? Your ass used to be beautiful. She tells Odo that she thought he was different than the Cardassians. But now it turns out he's just a murderer like everybody else. But, she says, hey, who am I to throw stones, right? I've killed people, too. Like, so many people. And Kira says to Odo, look, just tell me there's no more innocent blood on your hands. Tell me this was the only time. All Odo can tell her is, I'm not sure. I hope so. There are a few reasons I chose this episode. The main one is that it's my favorite Odo-centric show of the whole series. It's just a really, really good episode with, as I alluded to during my snarky summary, a wonderful Twilight Zone-like quality to it. But it's also a very important episode for Odo's character development. 
and a strong showcase for the acting talents of René Auberginois. So let's start with the first of those. Odo is already an interesting character on paper when the series begins. He's a fascinating bundle of contradictions, the outsider who doesn't understand humanoids but has nonetheless made it his job to enforce their laws, the shapeshifter who can assume any form but is inflexible in his ethical code and personal habits, the cop who was somehow trusted by both a genocidal authoritarian regime and the victims of that regime. And see, it's that last one that never really held up to scrutiny. Because think about it. How? How could Odo have been acceptable to both the Cardassians and the Bajorans? Prior to things past, the explanation was always something like, well, Odo only cared about enforcing the law. He didn't take sides. But think about that. The Cardassians were invaders. They were military occupiers of Bajor. They established a dictatorship. They robbed Bajor of its natural resources. They enslaved and murdered the Bajoran people. How do you enforce their laws without taking a side? You don't. That's the answer. You don't. Even in the make-believe world of Star Trek, the notion of the man apart who lives by his code and is able to earn the respect of both the oppressors and the oppressed by calling it down the middle, maintaining his own perch on the moral high ground in the process, is a fantasy. And a nonsensical fantasy at that. If there is a moral high ground and a conflict between oppressors and the oppressed, it's not in the middle, it's on the side of the oppressed. And yet, the fantasy of the neutral observer dispensing true justice untainted by subjectivity or emotional bias is an appealing one to many people. It was obviously appealing to Kira, who clung to it despite experiencing the horrors of the Cardassian occupation close up and nursing a special enmity for collaborators. But Kira is too smart for that. And Deep Space Nine is too smart of a show for that. So, after establishing the fantasy of Odo the Just and letting it ride for a few years, the creators finally shatter it with the sledgehammer of things past. No, Odo was not blameless during the occupation. Yes, Odo was the servant of an oppressive, unjust regime. Yes, Odo's status as an agent of that regime skewed his sense of justice and led to him sending at least three innocent people to their deaths. This is Deep Space Nine. There are no spotless consciences. There are no flawless heroes. And make no mistake, Odo is a hero. If he wasn't, he wouldn't be so ashamed of his role in the executions of Ishan, Jalor, and Timor. He is a person of conscience. He does regret his actions. In showing us that Odo has acted contrary to his ethics, Deep Space Nine also allows us to see that those ethics aren't just a set of rules to be followed. They really matter to Odo. He doesn't just care about maintaining order and the rule of law. He cares about doing the right thing and being a good person, and he is haunted by his failure to do so in the case of the three innocent Bajorans who were executed on his watch. That's a lot of heavy-duty characterization for an actor to get across, especially when it involves a character as stoic as Odo typically is. Lucky for us, Odo is portrayed by René Auberginois, an actor who, and I say this with all the love in the world for this franchise, was almost too good for Star Trek. By the time Deep Space Nine debuted in 1993, Auberginois was already a television veteran, probably best known for playing Clayton Endicott III, the supercilious chief of staff on Benson. He had also racked up an impressive resume of supporting roles in films like M.A.S.H. and McCabe and Mrs. Miller, and guest appearances on TV shows both comedic and dramatic, like Night Gallery, The Jeffersons, The Bob Newhart Show, Wonder Woman, and Murder, She Wrote. He was an instantly recognizable face and showed fantastic comic timing, but I don't think he got a chance to really show off his acting talents until he got the role of Odo. Things Past isn't the first time we get to see Auberginois take Odo out of his stiff, reserved comfort zone. In Season 3's Heart of Stone, Odo reveals that he has fallen in love with Kira, and the act of expressing his long-hidden feelings is exhausting for him. He seems physically pained by it. 
When called upon to reveal the depth of emotion Odo keeps carefully controlled beneath the surface, a bourgeois would open himself up, showing a vulnerability that was truly affecting, especially in comparison to Odo's typical demeanor. He has such a moment near the end of things past, when Odo finally confesses to his friends about his complicity in the wrongful executions. It's a marvelous, fearless piece of acting. A bourgeois gets to show us yet another side of Odo in an episode from a little later in Season 5, Children of Time. In this episode, the crew of the Defiant discovers a planet populated by their own descendants, the result of a time travel accident they are destined to have when they attempt to leave the planet. The only survivor of the accident still alive when the present-day Defiant arrives is Odo, who has been living here for 200 years. This is a very different Odo from the one we've come to know. He's gotten a lot better at humanoid faces, for one. He's calmer, more at peace. He's a lot more philosophical. And he's sadder. There's a mixture of love and pain in his eyes when he looks at Kira, who, from his perspective, has been dead for two centuries, that cuts through me every time I see it. Also, he's kind of a daddy. Am I using that right? Never mind. The point is, whether it's the one-shot result of time travel shenanigans or enduring, layered character development built up over multiple seasons of television, Odo grows changes, becomes more complex, and finishes the series as one of the most interesting and multifaceted characters on the show. He's the ideal conscience for Deep Space Nine, not in spite of his failings, but because of them. Because the times when he falls short only cast more light on how important it is to him to get it right the next time. To be someone the people he works with, by the end of the series, the people he loves, can depend on and be proud of. As is the case with pretty much everyone on Deep Space Nine, that growth and complexity is the result of equal parts writing and acting. On the writing side, Odo benefits from the talents of numerous people. Michael Piller, Ira Stephen Bear, Rene Echeverria, Robert Hewitt Wolf, among others, some of the best writers ever to work on a Star Trek show. But when it comes to the acting, He's the creation of one person. One person who took everything those writers put down on the page and brought it to life. Writing is important, but the best writer in the world can't overcome a bad actor. Fortunately, the writers who created Odo didn't have that problem. They got René Auberginois. They lucked out. So did we. Hey folks, well, hope you enjoyed the Odo video, the tribute to René Albergenois. Hopefully we have a little bit of a break between now and the next time we lose a major Star Trek actor, because boy, this has been a rough year for that. Especially the last quarter of 2019, we had uh, the death of Aaron Eisenberg and D.C. Fontana and René Albergenois and others who played more supporting roles or were recurring characters or who guest starred in, in multiple Trek shows. There's been a lot of, uh, of death of uh, Star Trek actors lately, and it's... Whew, hope we get a break for a while. That would be nice. Uh, also, uh, this video, it just so happens, uh, will go live, will, will be published on Christmas Day. So for those of you watching it the day that it's published, uh, if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, happy holidays to everybody. Uh, next week will probably be a not actually Trek Actually video where I'll do a comment response video and kind of catch up on the comments I've gotten over the last uh, couple of months. There have been a, a ton of Trek Actually videos the last uh, couple of months due mostly, unfortunately, to me feeling the need to do tribute videos to uh, Star Trek actors and, and writers in the case of DC Fontana who have recently died. So uh, we do a, a comment response video next week. Um, and then uh, next month, 
uh, for the next regularly scheduled Regulation Trek Actually video. It will be on the subject of why Star Trek Enterprise has the worst ending ever. That's the subject that was chosen by the most recently completed poll of my Patreon patrons. I want to remind you that for a Patreon uh, pledge of any amount per month, you get access to the monthly poll that I use to determine the topics of upcoming Trek Actually videos. There's a topic up right now, uh, or a poll right now, to choose the topic for February's regulation uh, Trek Actually video. So if you are a patron, uh, you can go vote on that if you haven't voted already. And uh, if you want to vote and you want to help choose the next topic or, or, or topics of future Trek Actually videos going forward, you can go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives and become a patron of mine for any amount per month. And you get access to the poll and you can vote in the poll. And if you vote or if you pledge $5 a month or more, in addition to getting access to the poll and all the other stuff, you also uh, get yourself a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. So there's a little bit of extra uh, incentive for you if you want to help me continue to produce these videos. I also want to remind you, as I always do at the end of these videos, that in addition to Star Trek videos, I am also the co-host of a couple of podcasts alongside the great Jason Harding. We co-host a movie review podcast called Late Seating, where just recently we, we completed our reviews of the uh, six uh, Star Wars original trilogy and prequel trilogy movies, and uh, you can go back and listen to those if you're in kind of a Star Wars mood as opposed to a Star Trek mood. Um, and also, uh, I co-host a Star Trek-themed comedy podcast called The Ensign's Log, where Jason and I play characters who are uh, low-ranking officers serving aboard a certain legendary Federation starship as it embarks on a certain historic five-year mission. I think you get where I'm going with this. It's it's a lot of fun. We're in uh, we're getting close to the end of our second season, and we've really really enjoyed it. And a lot of you who have listened have had very nice things to say. So if you have not been listening to the Ensign's Log and you dig the Star Trek stuff and you like comedy with kind of a Star Trek spin to it, uh, check out the Ensign's Log. It's linked. In the description of this video, you can listen on SoundCloud or on the uh, Let Me Fin or Let Me Listen podcast uh, website, or you can subscribe via RSS using your favorite podcast app. Any way you want, you can really listen to uh, the the Late Seating podcast and the Ensign's Log podcast. Uh, so there you go. Those are my shameless plugs. Thank you again so much for watching this video. I hope you found it a, a, an appropriate tribute to the memory of the great Rene Abergenois, who we will dearly miss. And uh, I'll see you next week for a comment response video, and then a few weeks after that for a proper scripted Trek Actually video about the ending of Star Trek Enterprise and why that was kind of a letdown to a lot of people. So see you next time, folks. Thanks for watching. Take care.